I remember pinching myself during the shooting because we'd have a shed each. I mean, these sheds are built specifically for this job. So Paige and I had a massive garage built each side of side by side on a concrete pad and then it was decked out with any tool you could ever imagine all the welders all the cutters mig welders tig welders plasma cutters grinders uh, and then uh, we were charged with pimping a household item using a lot of the experts that we had in and people would bring you food and coffee from time to time and i mean seriously <laughs> That was, that was my ideal gig. I mean, as I've said before, it's fair to say there could be worse jobs. That was fantastic. It was a 12, 13, 14 hour day sometimes and I never got sick of it. People are loving it. There's been a real sort of groundswell and that's one of those, I think it's a bit of a slow burn and people are getting a cottoning onto it and they love the Kiwi ingenuity. I think it's also, it's not necessarily too blokey. I think um, we, we've got a, hopefully, got a good female following in, the, in those who like to see male fallibility. You know, we muck things up really badly. And I think apparently that's quite compelling to a woman to see men doing that. <laughs> so we have, uh, we have them on board and obviously the men on board as well because they, you know, they might be jealous of that and everyone likes an explosion. So, yeah, you know, yeah, it's a good, um, good formula, I think. Bringing a radio guy in who had spent, you know, a good 10 to 15 years uh, honing my craft on, on radio, having a radio guy in there who could ad lib and who could just run off the cuff and do stuff and actually pad freaked a lot of people out, I think. There was a lot of, you know, I mean, a lot of those who I work with, some of those who I work with were freaked out by it. It was like, what are you doing? I mean, there's the auto cues there. What the, what's he saying? Who's he saying? What do I say? How do I react to what he's saying? I haven't got any response on my auto cue. What do I, you know? And there'd be something in the direction here like, uh, what, James, uh, you know, what, and I'd be like, come on. Yeah, let's just roll with this. And I suppose that nervousness um, transcended the, the dynamic actually. It was a fantastic gig, I really liked it and for some reason or other it didn't really, it didn't work and I think a lot of that had to do with the competition, you know, um, uh, love him or hate him, you, you, you've you got uh, an enormous juggernaut of a broadcaster to compete with in Paul Henry. Things aren't, it's interesting now, it's interesting days now, you know, that's that's changed so I, I wonder sometimes whether or not TV3 could have held out for a bit longer and whether there would have been any competition at all. I think it went from the, the wish to or, or the, um, the intention to let this thing bed in for how long, however long it took to, oh my God, we're going to get some numbers on the board uh, or we're going to stop hemorrhaging money and uh, what are we going to do? And I kind of felt that pressure. There was a lot of pressure on us and there were a lot of meetings and bits and pieces. And uh, I don't know, I didn't really, uh, didn't really think they had the formula right. And uh, I didn't agree with a lot of, or some of, some of Sunrise. Uh, and uh, a lot of, some of Sunrise didn't agree with me. So I thought, let's just cut, let's go. And I mean, thank goodness. <laughs> It didn't go from strength to strength after I left. You know, it would have been like, oh, okay. <laughs> it didn't. Um, it sort of uh, flat, it found it after however long it was, a year or two later. Um, and obviously, the day I left, it was doomed. <laughs> <laughs> the Jackie Brown Diaries uh, was fantastic. Uh, I've got to say at the outset though, it required a fairly thick skin because if I remember rightly, I mean, I'd finished on Sunrise um, a year or two before that or a year before that, and I think my character's name was James Coleman. He was a failed television host who'd gone out to stud in radio. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Jackie and I had worked together in radio before and knew each other quite well on this. Um, story or our story was sort of based on some reality. I mean things had happened 
in the radio studio that were similar to what we saw on TV, but they weren't, I mean, obviously very dramatised on television, but I'm not prepared to say what happened and what didn't happen. I didn't realise how big my part was going to be. I thought that maybe I'd be there for an episode or something like that, but it ended up being in every single episode. So either I wasn't listening at the initial meeting when they asked me if I wanted to be in the show, or they just decided either partway in that they'd write me in a bit further, or in fact they told me from the outset and I didn't hear, I don't know. But uh, it was a brilliant, uh, brilliant show. I played a gay man whose good friend had just killed himself jumping off the, off the, off the Grafton Bridge in Auckland. Uh, and that part was played by Joel Tobeck, and uh, it, was a, it was a film by Brita McVeigh. Brilliant film, really lovely, and it was based on a short story by Emily Perkins. And I uh, auditioned for that and got the part, and I was living in Wellington at the time, and came up to Auckland. And that was a brilliant experience, working with some really uh, experienced actors. It was a part that didn't have a lot of dialogue. I didn't say an awful lot, so it was quite a, quite a bit of stillness. And at that time, I think I felt, it felt awkward to be still. And I think that's something that's, that's, that I've learnt pr uh, since then, is that, you know, it's actually quite important and that stillness uh, often says far more, you know, less is more and all that and uh, so I so I spent a lot of time learning about just underplaying stuff, underselling stuff. It was certainly a step up from from anything that I'd done before and you know there was an expectation that you you had your lines, you had to hit your cues, you had to do what was required. There's a completely different feeling when you are on set and there are a million different lights and there are a million different people behind the camera and the camera's moving and stuff like that and then there's action, you know. Um, it's, it's a definite skill involved in being able to shut yourself off from everything that's going along around and just become that character uh, in and amongst all the distractions. For its time, I think it was, uh, it was very, it was about that lock, stock and two smoking barrels style show in around about the same sort of time. So we had that whole, the style was, you know, you'd have that, um, what do you call it, sort of fast track stuff where it would go really quickly and then you'd have like, for instance, a pool ball would hit the pocket and bounce up and then the camera would spin around it, you know, that kind of thing, which is really cool and we were really excited about that sort of thing. But I think, you know, it was such a great film, but I think it dated really quickly because of that. I think if you look at it now, um, it was stunning at the time. We were just thinking, wow, this is so rock and roll. It's fantastic. But looking at it now, you think, yep, that was definitely a period where film really did that whole thing. And I suppose it was, went hand in hand with editing techniques and stuff like that, and being able to, and also, you know, hardware. Um, and you were able to really, you know, broaden the whole experience. Um, but it seems to sort of, Really commonplace now.